Omar. Hi. You did such a good job being hosted. Yes. First time. First time, and I hope I get invited back again because I had a tremendous time. And I understand, Eric, why guests love being on Iron Culture. Well, I'm honored that you wanted to be on your own podcast <laughs> with my podcast as well. Yeah. But no, this was a really cool episode. This was something I, 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 th I think we talked about probably last year was the first time I brought up the idea of getting some of the quote unquote uh, good people in the in the fit in the supplement industry on the podcast because I think for anyone who's been involved especially in the bodybuilding community they've seen they've accepted a certain level of I'm just going to say ridiculousness with a supplement company promises that are obviously false um, poor quality stuff you know you, you see headlines about painted supplements uh, or or things happening in terms of manufacturing quality or even sometimes health scandals. And you just kind of brush it off because you expect that coming out of certain sectors of the supplement industry. Um, and I think fortunately, uh, through the work that the, our guests on this podcast and others have done, that is changing. Uh, and something you brought up was the knowledge asymmetry between the consumer and the holder of the keys and the people who would use science as marketing. We've talked about that a lot. Hashtag science, science is marketing on iron culture. And I think the supplement industry has historically uh, been the largest guilty party in, in manipulating science to get sales. And as Ben Escrow talked about on this podcast, and I realize I haven't said who's on the podcast yet, but I will in a second. Just be patient, listener. Just wait. Okay, don't roll your eyes. Um, said that um, specifically Ben Escrow said how people are motivated by fear with supplements. They don't want to miss out on gains. They think as soon as I see a, a supplement come out and they are some pseudoscientific claim about it improving my gains, well, I better as well just add that to my already huge pill case that weighs about as much as the weights I lift just to make sure I'm not missing out on anything. And that's the, that's the mindset. I've been there. Most of you listeners have been there, but hopefully we're starting to shift that, uh, that, that, that culture, uh, that mentality, and not even just within ourselves, but also within the industry. And that's why I'm very pleased to have had yourself, Omar, as a representative of Ouroboros, which I hopelessly mispronounced at the start of this podcast. Um, and then also Ben Esgro, uh, for is it almost a decade now, has been at the helm uh, of De Novo Nutrition. And then also uh, Mike Matthews of Legion. And unfortunately, we couldn't be joined by, by Dan of Citadel Nutrition, but it's also just, just to give them a shout out, a great company who used to uh, sponsor our 3DMJ athletes back in the day. So anyway, that's my preamble. What, what did you think about this episode? No, Eric, I think you nailed it. There's more than enough space for everyone. There's no need the concept of uh, cannibalization. Oh, there can only be so many good evidence-based uh, companies out there. Nah, it, it doesn't work that way at all. And it's nice to see other companies that almost take that Hippocratic oath uh, to the way they approach things of doing no harm. The whole concept of some supplement companies increase the knowledge asymmetry, right? So they purposely mm -hmm. want to mislead you and they want you to keep buying things that might not be effective, things that for them lead to a higher profit margin. And so we dovetail into an interesting conversation of where does profit, what is the role of profit, how large of a role should it play in the company? There's many things we talk about. There's supplements uh, soliloquy. So I think it's a fascinating conversation and it's very interesting to hear two other individuals that once again are trying to change the industry starting with, you know, formulating a company. So I enjoyed the conversation. I think you did a fantastic job, Eric, of hosting. Um, I now I now understand more than ever why this is the Iron Cult. Never going to die. Never going to die. And like you said, yeah. if you enjoy supplement soliloquies, yeah. monohydrate <laughs> monologues, <laughs> This is the one to tune into. You get to learn a, a true peek behind the curtain of what it's like to try to set up an evidence-based supplement company in the modern age. Folks, I am happy to be joined by these three titans. And by titans, I mean small startup supplement companies and, and a huge sea of, of giant uh, supplement companies. In our companies. own minds. Yes, titans in our own minds, which is all moms. that matters. At least, especially our moms, hopefully, because uh, who needs dads? Uh, mama's boys in the house. Um, so anyway, uh, we've got my my good friend. You might have heard of him before, Omar Isif, on on, on with me here at Iron Culture, uh, head of what I affectionately call Arbros or mm -hmm. Arboros Nutrition, mm -hmm. um, maker of the uh, the multivitamin, mm -hmm. maker of uh, what used to be. I won't even name it. I don't want to get you in legal trouble. So, so no. what's the official title of your pre now? 
just pre work. So you could have called it Singularity, the original name. It was Gnosis. We had to deal with a little bit of an Italian company that w- was selling veterinarian uh, services. We'll get into that, I'm sure, mm-hmm. in this episode. Cool. Yeah. So uh, Singularity now pre. There's also pre plus plus, which which is uh, for those who really have a, a caffeine addiction. Um, then we've got my my good friend going back a long ways, uh, Ben Escrow of De Novo Nutrition. Been doing the damn thing for a, a long, long time. Uh, and then, of course, Mike Matthews of Legion Athletics. Uh, full disclosure, I'm on the Scientific Advisory Board of Legion Athletics, and we can talk about that as well. Uh, the reason why I have these three gentlemen in the house, and unfortunately, apologies sent by Citadel, Citadel Nutrition, another uh, very, very good uh, company ran by good people, um, is that I, th- I would say you guys are iconoclasts, to use a big word that is just at the extent of my intelligence, um, in, in the supplement industry. So first, uh, there will be a, an introduction that we do afterwards, but I'd like to have you each tell a little bit about who you are and, and who you are in the role of running the, the supplement companies you run. Since we have it in the order that we started, Omar Yusuf, tell me a little about Arboros. So Ouroboros uh, was Ouroboros. formerly- Ouroboros, you're like fine. just hating hey. me this whole time. No, don't, don't <laughs> worry about it. Uh, listen, it's an old word. It's a Greek word. It actually comes from Egyptian mythology. And I think it was symbolic because we had a little bit of that Gnostic mysticism in our original brand where we called it Gnosis, which was a name that meant something dear to me. So we had our first brand, Gnosis. And then, like I said, we don't have to go into the details. It's actually totally fine how it happened. But there was a company that did have a trademark, an Italian company, that thought it was too similar for Gnosis Nutrition. So we changed it. We rebranded under Ouroboros, which also, once again, deals with the whole uh, concept in Gnosticism. Um, Just a symbol of the serpent that goes all the way back to Egyptian mythology. Some really cool stuff. Anyway, so we started that several years ago. The idea behind it was that I was tired of being the middleman for my crippling creatine addiction. I wanted to be the head honcho. And so the idea I felt is that there was enough space, more than enough space, for more evidence-based companies, supplement companies. At their time, there was just a handful. And I saw that amongst the people that were my followers or amongst the people that I noticed on YouTube, despite there being some good supplements out there or supplement companies, the ones they were using were rather generic. So the market penetration just wasn't there. I saw potentially a space. I also saw from some of my experience with marketing, the branding too. So it's not just the evidence-based component, but the transparency of uh, how you market the product could be cool. It, I always envision it as a side project. So something that I didn't have to be tied to were the direct income or the profit I live and die by the sword. So I could do it uh, as a side project. So in, in that way, it changes some of the decisions I would make. We did Ouroboros uh, three years ago. We started it. Slowly, it's been accumulating, let's say, uh, traction over time. I actually, full disclosure, as you said, Eric, when I was starting it out, I contacted you for the pre-work that I had the idea of what I want in my head. And then uh, luckily through some of the contacts in the industry, once again, you're able to point me by the time it came uh, for us to you know, formulate a multivitamin, they were able to direct us to Dr. Peter Fishin to do that. So that was cool. But our whole intent is essentially evidence-based supplements with the highest effective doses at an affordable price and no, oh, no hype, no bullshit marketing, just what works in the right ingredients for once again, an affordable price. So that's our story. I love it. Yeah. yeah. And I, I have conflicts of interest with everyone who is <laughs> and would have been on this podcast. So like, like I said, I'm on the scientific advisory board for, for Legion. I've, uh, you know, I gave you some feedback on, on the pre on what I thought would be some, some good, good stuff. And I connect you with Peter Fitchin, um, with, with DeNovo, you know, when, when they had a bit of a merger with, uh, well, not a merger with the company, but when Luke Johnson from what was shredded by science Academy and now it's PTC collective, that was, uh, something that, that I brought up to Luke Johnson. And, and so far, that's been a, a really good thing to see for DeNovo. We'll talk about it. I won't put words in your mouth, Ben. So anyway, I am just, um, you know, Architect. very incestuous po- po- uh, podcast for me, mm-hmm. uh, which, yeah. which, you the know, COVID, the fan. COVID of fitness. Absolutely. Everybody. Yeah. And you can see that if it's not fitness, I really don't know much about it. I mean, it just goes to show you when you deep dive on something, how many life skills you lose, like <laughs> pronouncing words that you haven't been exposed to before. Ouroboros, or or in my case, like <laughs> I had only learned to ride a bike in 2010, you know. So Eric, can you, Eric, can you your... swim? I can swim. That I can yeah. do. Okay. Fortunately, so <laughs> I have some. A bike. Oh, well, maybe not. You never know. Yeah, you know, swimming will save my life. Riding a bike just means that I might get somewhere faster than walking. But who <laughs> wants that? How how does my Fitbit even count <laughs> steps if I'm on a bike? Bullshit, right? Eric, in your defense, uh, my brother, I would say that the pronunciation of that word, right? 
It's up actually for debate because it's an old word, and I'm sure there's multiple ways of pronouncing it, so don't you worry about it. Thank you, my Canadian friend. It's your um, truth, Eric. Speak your truth, yeah? I appreciate that. There is no objective truth. <laughs> All right. Speaking of objective truth, my good friend Ben Escrow, I think, and I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put, not, not words in your mouth, but I'm going to give you my perception of you and take it, take it for what you will. Okay. I think while many people who have started the whole process of having a quote-unquote evidence-based um, supplement company, uh, they, the, a part of their mission was because they wanted to change the culture, do good work, provide value. I think that is all there for you. And you're an incredibly analytical person. Your, your, your knowledge base in your area is especially impressive. However, as the formulator who primarily is actually doing the damn thing, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, I get an element that there is some creative energy, artistic energy. And uh, I think you probably have a, a pretty strong motivation to do interesting things with your supplement company, not just be like, hey, I've read PubMed a lot and I want to make sure <laughs> right. that we've got the, uh, the, right, the right supplements on the market and not the ones that don't do anything. W would you say that I'm off base or not? No, I think you nailed it. I'm actually impressed. Um, I, I, I like that to come through. Um, I guess kind of going along the theme, if you don't mind, I'll kind of give my, my quick, quick and dirty backstory. Um, but first I'll start I like by... long and dirty too, just, just for the record. <laughs> go for it. Either way. Um, but first in answering that, yeah, I, I think, I think that's exactly what the intent is in doing anything. And it's, it's partly to be unique in a territory that's incredibly saturated, but it's also, it's also a personal thing where, um, if I'm not excited, how the hell am I going to get anybody else excited about it? Like if we're all just putting creatine, uh, in the same form, in the same dose, uh, then it very quickly becomes now we're fighting on price that there's, there yep. is no, you know, unique element. Um, so you, a lot of people can claim I'm, I'm evidence-based and they can accurately, uh, do so. But I think you also need to have another element beyond that because now the industry has caught up with that. Whereas, uh, nine years ago when I started, it was wide open. Um, yep. So basically, I started in 2011. Um, De Novo was just a concept in my mind. It was, uh, I was reading it in papers. I was reading it. So my first, uh, my, my first, my undergrad degree was in nutrition. Um, and through that, I was obviously a heavy, heavy supplement consumer because I believe the marketing, as I think everybody does when they first get in, is like, I just want to make gains quick. I want to, I it's that fear of like, maybe I'm not making them optimally as fast as I can. So of course the supplement hook, you know, attracted me immediately and, uh, through both school and experience of using supplements, I was very often disappointed because I think the trend still kind of seems to be, they over promise and undeliver under deliver, um, in supplements. And that's a large part of, of supplement marketing, which you can't deny is incredibly effective. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I was reading papers. I, I kept seeing this term come up, de novo, de novo lipogenesis, de novo. Uh, and, and basically what de novo means is from the beginning, it's a Latin word. And uh, in, in biochemistry or in biology, what it means is you're taking a simple precursor and making something more complex out of it. So I loved that concept. And then I thought, wow, this has a root in science, a lot of deep meaning in science. So the field that I'm studying, but also a lot of deep meaning for what I'm trying to do. Because there were no backers, there were no funders. I worked at at WIC, which is basically minimal income job, and I self-funded, you know, just buying raw protein powders and, and just wanting to figure it out. And the first, it started with the question, which was just, um, how, how do companies do this? Like, how do you make a protein powder? Uh, and I I knew it had to be possible because I knew all these companies didn't have these multi-million dollar backing funders. Um, so I just read stories and I just I just deep dove and, and wanted to figure it out and found that this company who everybody probably knows now, Isopure, uh, started with two guys in Texas with a cement mixer. And I was like, all right, I know how to sanitize. I learned this through doing my RD and through my, my nutrition uh, food sanitation background. I'm gonna go, I went to Home Depot, bought a cement mixer, started buying raw powders, bought a food chemistry book and just started playing with formulations. And uh, so it started with the protein only company and then since then, year on year, it's kind of expanded out and grown. And so I, I think 
to go back to the initial point, and so I can stop talking and let everybody else <laughs> have their time, is let that um, it, it continues to be both a personal, intellectual quest for me, and then also the challenge of how can I do something different and interesting with what's quickly becoming the same collection of ingredients that we can all play with? And how can I take an angle through either creativity or just continuing to dive down in education um, that keeps this interesting for me and, and for our consumers? Whether and, and, and what that needs to ultimately go down to is the subjective experience, but I want to back it up objectively with something to validate it scientifically. So um, that's my TED talk. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I absolutely love that, man. Um, and I think it comes through so well in your work. And I think you as a lifelong learner is something, I think that's where we connect. At least that, that's where I feel like I connect with you. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you just completed a master's in, in pharmacology. Is that accurate? Yeah. So uh, I, I just uh, finished. It's technically on the paper. It's a master's in pharmacy and then a concentration in pharmaceutical chemistry. But largely what we talk about is drug development. Um, and it, it does deal a lot with, um, or the program did deal a lot with actually dealing with the FDA uh, creating new drugs and then submitting them for approval. But I think people will, op and of course you guys will see this too, is the trend is very quickly moving into the overlap of pharmaceuticals and drug companies um, where you, now you need to be GMP. Um, FDA is getting tighter regulations on manufacturing. So everything, um, and I, we could probably go into all the reasons why that's happening, but uh, I knew that that's where the future is. Like that, the whole Ben doing a cement mixer nine years ago is, isn't a possibility anymore. Like it's just, it's just you know, you, you're, uh, and you see this across the board, like Amazon categorizing things and cutting people out, and so much of that happening. So um, I knew it was the future. Plus, I felt I reached my ceiling. I did, I did the RD, I did uh, a master's in sports nutrition, and I felt like my next efficiency was chemistry. How can I make a more unique formula? It's got to be something with pharmacology and chemistry. If I could make a new, you know, compound or something, uh, I think that would be the next step. So I just, I didn't so much feel like it was a choice. I felt like it was a necessity because mm -hmm. it, you know, the survival of DeNovo means the survival of Ben too, uh, because right. uh, this is what I want to do for a living. I, I don't want to do something else. I don't want to go work for a drug company. I feel like I can be most impactful here. And I mm -hmm. also feel like, I can direct the company and not become just some servant of, you know, complete profit margin, which isn't, a, you need to have it. And I've realized that the hard way, but, um, I, I can't just purely have that, that driver because that's too sterile for me. It's just, uh, it, it takes the excitement out because everybody's, you know, yeah. big companies are do, doing that and they're doing it very effectively. And I think it, I think ultimately it's short-sighted. You know, the um, the pure yeah. profit, uh, forgetting that, that profit should come from value. And I think uh, something you said there about being impactful uh, is something that I think really comes across in all three of your work. You know, Omar, obviously, you were a trainer and then providing YouTube content. Um, all of the companies you're involved with, in my opinion, have value, utility, uh, uniqueness and self-expression. Um, and that's rewarded. Yeah, respect. And I think all of you exemplify uh, education and, and, and informing the consumers. Um, I think Omar, you do that through your YouTube channel, Ben. And, and for those who don't remember, man, there was some gold content that did not get nearly the exposure. I wish it did where we had Mike T, Mike Zerdos, myself, you, Mike T Nelson on these round tables talking about these in-depth <laughs> complex topics. And I would say maybe like a 10th of the people who would enjoy that, that content saw it. It's but, gotta um, come back some, it has to come back somehow. I, I, I haven't yeah. forgotten about that either. Because that I, honestly, I, that. I I think we can take all that old content. This is a totally aside, and and just put it out on a broader platform. Because all of us involved now have broader platforms. But nonetheless, the point is, is that you you valued that. You put just as much time and effort into that as you did the main company. And I'm going to now segue to you, Mike, with Legion Athletics. One of the things I really appreciate is if you want to go read about one of your supplements. Like if you go read about Phoenix, your guys is probably one of the few quote unquote evidence based fat burners that actually exists. You not only learn about uh, Phoenix, but you learn about each one of the ingredients, 
the studies that are related to them, there's hyperlinks, and the overall context of how a calorie deficit, a high protein diet, and the appropriate process of dieting comes way before you even consider doing it. And that's true of every single one of your supplement pages. Someone goes to find what the silver bullet is, and not only do they end up getting you know, something that may not be a bullet because no supplements are, they get, a, they get the BB, but it's an effective BB. It does what it claims to do, but they find out what really is 90% of it. So tell me more about uh, the, the story of Legion Athletics. Yeah, so um, for me, I came, out, came into this quite differently. So I self-published a book back in 2012 called Bigger, Leaner, Stronger. So this was before Legion. Legion was 2014, was year one. And this was really just the book that I wish somebody would have given me back when I was 17 or 18, and it would have saved me time and frustration and would have just given me the, the fundamentals, the 20% that gives you the 80%, right? And at the time, there was no book like it that, that was a lot more stake than sizzle. Uh, what was out there was a lot of bullshit. It was mostly just marketing um, and, and looking at some of the fitness books. I'd say the only book at that time that was selling well was Starting Strength Consistently. It's a good book, of course. Uh, and then you have Frederick De Delevy, De Delevier, De how do you pronounce his last name? But those are just illustrations. Like here's a bunch of uh, exercises and here's the muscle groups that they work. But there wasn't just an all-in-one like, all right, if you're a dude and you want to gain 25 to 30 pounds of muscle, get to 10% body fat, and you're going to be happy – Here's what you need to know, because you don't really need to know that much to do that, right? And um, so I just kind of wrote that book and was scratching my own itch, so to speak. And at the time, uh, Amazon's self-publishing platform, it's called KD, KDP, Kindle Direct Publishing, I think, that was getting, that I heard about it because it was getting, it was they, they had a whole publicity campaign going because there was a dude named John Locke who was the first guy to sell a million books on their platform, right? And the guy had kind of a cool story. He made a bunch of money in insurance. Um, and then he was like, okay, hey, I don't have to work for money anymore. What do I actually want to do on I want to write quirky thriller sex novels for women. So that's what he did. And because he didn't care. Like all of us. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's the dream. I mean, uh, and he, because he didn't care about the money, he just priced the, the, the books at 99 cents. And that was a novelty then. And the fact that they were real books and, you know, he actually educated himself on how to write, uh, not just fiction, but also there's, there's a, a bit of a science to storytelling as well and worked with good editors. So this was higher quality stuff than people were expecting for 99 cents. And, and so he, he quickly gained a lot of popularity, sold a bunch of books. Amazon took that and spun it into marketing for their platform. Like, Hey, this dude did it. You could do it too. And so I heard about it and that Does anyone else, I'm sorry. Does anyone else find it ironic that I'm assuming his pen name, John Locke, like take the English philosopher and, and some of the, the concepts of, of, of all the like the political concepts we have, and he goes, you know what I'm going to do with this this heavy name, this this <laughs> weight no, on my back. I'm going to write. Nobody knows any and that, my trashy romance novel. Definitely do not know who, <laughs> let alone have read John Locke. No, uh, <laughs> it, it, you know, ironically, ironically, you think it'd be a pen name. Um, I think I think it actually is. I think it actually is his name because he he had made a bit of a name for himself in in, in the insurance space because right. he had he Fair built call. up an insurance company, sold it, did it again. And then, you know, now he had tens of millions of dollars. Just like, fuck it, whatever. Um, okay. I apologize, John Locke. That is your name. <laughs> since you, that's actually what your real name is. You can write whatever you want. No, no more, no more judgment. Carry on, Mike. Um, so, so at the time, I, I, I'm putting together this manuscript and a buddy of mine. So I, this is the first time when I had gotten lean, really like lean ish for the first time, maybe 8% body fat where, where most guys want, would like to be right. Just like your average kind of fitness guys. And one of my friends, one of my friends who I was working out with at the time, he was like, uh, you should just take your shirt off and go on YouTube and sell shit. And I was like, I just can't do it. dude. No, nah, it's just not, it's just not me. I'm, I'm, I, that, that does not, uh, get me, get me going at all. And, but when I heard about the, this Kindle thing, I was like, all right, a book I can get behind. I, I like to read. I like books. I like the industry. I'll do that. And so that's what I did. I published it in 2012. I didn't bother getting an agent or trying to go the traditional route because I knew that why would anybody, why would any publishing company want to take a, a shot on me? I had no connections. I had no platform. I was just some dude who wrote a book. So why bother? It's much smarter to 
uh, do it yourself and do it well. And then if you want to work with publishers, you have something to show for yourself and you, you will get offers and you'll get much better offers than if you happen to get an offer the first when you don't have anything. But I published it in 2012 and it sold like 20 copies in the first month. And I was actually happy. I didn't know. I didn't know if it, anyone, it was 99 cents and it wasn't as big as it is now. It didn't have as much information as it, as it does now. Um, it has changed quite a bit over the years, but it was a, a minimum viable product to use a lean startup term. It was something that was good enough. It was worth getting out there to see if anybody cared. And so 20 copies the first month. And I was happy. I was like, well, shit, somebody bought my book. I, I, I was thought there was probably a 50% chance it was going to be zero, right? And then it was um, like 40 copies the next month. And it was Kindle only in the beginning, right? Didn't even use that. I don't even know if they had, I think they had create space at the time. But anyway, fast forward by the end of the year, it's now in paperback. Uh, I don't think the audiobook was out yet, maybe, but um, Kindle obviously. And it was selling several thousand copies a month. And the price was a bit higher. So it was becoming more of an established book. 99 cent books are also, are, especially now, are viewed as literal trash. But um, if you can sell thousands of copies at, I don't remember the exact price at that time, maybe $4 or $5 a month, uh, or sorry, a, a book, then, then that's considered, oh, that's actually something. Right. And so, so I saw there's an opportunity there and I continued then to, at first, actually, I was looking at, all right, what do I want to really, what do I want to do? Do I want to continue down this road, uh, and produce more fitness content, or do I want to start a publishing company? And just take what I've learned about publishing books and write, because I myself initially, ironically speaking of writing uh, thriller, sexy thrillers, my, my original interest in writing, and I still have an interest in, in it, is fiction uh -huh. and not, not, not that style, uh, but, but, and so I've also, I've written, I've written a book on the bill of rights. I've written a, kind of a self-help type book. I've written other stuff and, and I, and I, initially I was like, eh. I don't really want to just focus on fitness. I like fitness personally. I like what it can do for people. There are certain things I like about the education side of it and the learning side of it, but I don't like a lot of the culture. Uh, and especially just the, we see that now writ large across social media, a lot of the fitness, and maybe this wouldn't, wouldn't apply to our respective uh, areas and the, and the type of people who follow us, but, but just kind of the mainstream Fitspo fitness influencer type of culture. I, there, a lot of it doesn't resonate with me. I think a lot of it is just unhealthy. Even if even if we start with an unhealthy obsession with body image, and or just the body in general, the idea that you like live just to 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 take care of your body, like that's your only thing that you have is you 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 just serve your body twenty four hours a day, and uh, is is a bit odd to me. And <laughs> You're getting me all excited. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but anyway, I was, I started to go and I was like, eh, I'm going to, I'm going to do, I'm gonna do publishing and I'll, I'll write some more fitness stuff because I like it and it's helpful, and, but I'm going to do other stuff too. And, but then I changed my mind basically. and was like, eh, okay. So there's definitely an opportunity here. I'm interested in, in really going all in into fitness if I can do it my way. And that mean, and at the time I was like, I'm not interested in doing is trying to suck up to the gatekeepers to suck up to go try to beg my way into other people's uh, good graces so they will let, have me on their podcast and let me guest post on their website or um, or somehow try to leech followers from them right so I was like if I can just create content and I and, I, and I'll write I'll record podcasts maybe I'll do some video stuff but if I can do that and build a following and just go straight to the people who would maybe buy other things from me, then that I'm interested in doing. And so that's what I decided to do. And so I wrote more books and I started a website in 2013 called Muscle for Life, where muscleforlife.com, right, where I was writing articles and that grew very quickly because the SEO space was a lot less glutted at that time. And it was, this was pre Google Medic update, obviously. It was a lot easier to rank for stuff than it is now. Um, and, and so that, that grew very quickly and I was selling a lot of books and then supplements it was something I get asked about. I was getting asked about all the time. And I actually, I had some recommendations up at most for life of products I was using. And my recommendations were like barely recommend. They were barely endorsements. They were like, all, I was, I was using ons protein at the time. And I was saying it, it 
tastes like shit uh, to me. I, I don't like the taste really. I was using their, their natural. Their artificial tastes okay, but I was using their naturally sweetened. And I was like, this stuff tastes bad, uh, but it's cheap. And and they on is the, you know they they've they've been vetted a number of times on the internet where people who work at labs you know get proteins and test them. So you're you're getting real protein. It's not amino spiked. It's not bullshit. Um, their pre workout I was using and I, my endorsement. I don't remember the exact wording, but basically I was like the formulation's pretty bad, but I don't like coffee and. I guess like half a half dose of beta alanine and citrulline is maybe better than none. Um, and I'm sometimes I use this, sometimes I use caffeine pills. That's it. And so that was, there were a few products that that's basically the level of my enthusiasm for them at the time. But I was, I was selling a lot of them through Amazon affiliate links, which I was track. I didn't really care about the income. It wasn't very much money, but I was just curious, like, does anybody care what I have to say about these products? And there was a point where it just became obvious that, okay, if people are willing to buy stuff that I'm recommending and I'm barely recommending it, I'm basically saying, you don't need any of this. None of this really excites me. None of it's very good, but I guess it's good enough. What if I made stuff again, coming back to that scratch my own itch kind of analogy. What if I did that in supplements? What if I made stuff that I just wanted first and foremost for myself really? And, and then hopefully, hopefully it turns into something, maybe it doesn't, but I knew I wasn't going to get stuck with the, the inventory. I knew that the initial investment of maybe it was a hundred thousand dollars. There's no way I'm going to lose that money. Maybe it doesn't turn into anything. Maybe it kind of just fizzles or it just sells a little bit on the side and it's never that exciting, but fuck it. Why not? Basically. And, mm -hmm. um, so that, that's really how, how it started. And, and early on, I found, um, Curtis, who's, who's the brain behind examine.com. He's the guy who did essentially all the research and all the technical writing that you see on that website. Uh, still, Curtis Frank. Yeah. Curtis Frank still to today, Smart guy. Yeah, still to today, uh, that, that, that holds true. And I, I came across him via examine and I immediately was like, okay, this guy actually knows stuff. And, um, he, at the time, he was working with me on formulations and I have to give him the credit. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an actual moron, uh, when it comes to supplementation and, and the biology of it compared to him. So again, I take no credit for, for the formulations themselves. I really can't, I've maybe added a, a couple, um, things here and there that for some reason he, he just happened to miss, but nothing major. And at the time though, because of his work with the examin, he just didn't want to be, he liked the idea and that I was willing to actually spend money on my products and give him real budgets to work with, uh, which is still the case to today. I mean, at the, at the in the beginning, my cost of goods was so ridiculous. Any, but any business savvy person would have just laughed at me. that would have been like, you like losing money, don't you? Cause that's, what's about to happen. Just so you know. Um, and anyway, Curtis though, he just, he, we had an NDA where he just asked if, if basically I, I could not, he'll work on it, but he doesn't want any uh, official affiliation or, or even credit for the work because examine, they just wanted to stay fully independent, similar to our, our arrangement, uh, Eric, where yeah. Yeah, exactly the same type of thing. Right. And it wasn't, it was known that he was doing it. Like he was getting paid some money for it, but it was more just a point of like, he didn't want Legion to be even known as, Oh, this is examines line or anything like that. You know what I mean? Um, and so that's, I, I came, I started working with Curtis early on and now fast forward. I'm assuming that NDA is, is no longer applying. Yes, exactly. Well, now, I mean, now, <laughs> now, now he still has, he still has some equity in, in, uh, examine, but he, he, he's working with, with me full time on research and he, and he helps create some content. He does formulation. Um, he's involved in some of the scientific research that we're funding and some of the new, new projects that we have coming up on, on that. And, um, so, so yeah, and coming all the way back to just your original, what you were saying regarding the education, that's why my focus from the beginning was education. And, you know, there, you have markets, have people uh, in, in a marketplace have various levels of sophistication, right? So you have very unsophisticated buyers. And I use that term intentionally that not stupid, and maybe there's some ignorance there, but sophistication is the better word where let's say somebody's new to, to fitness and they're like, I just want to lose 30 pounds. Uh, what do I do? Do I do keto? Do I, uh, you know, uh, 
do the HCG thing or or whatever. They just don't really know what they're doing. And, and they start clicking around on Amazon and they see a product that says, just swallow these pills and you'll lose 20 pounds in your first month. And, and, and they go, okay, and they do it. Um, now, some people might assume, oh, that person is just stupid. And not necessarily. Some people are just busy and they just go, you know, yeah, it sounds too good to be true. It probably isn't going to work, but it's 30 bucks. And they they think that the supplement industry is more regulated than it is. And so they're like, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? I'm going to lose my 30 bucks. Big deal. And so you have a lot of those people out there. And that's an ever renewing pool of, of customers, too, where you have people who are leaving that and moving on to a higher level of sophistication. They've been burned enough. They know that's not true. And those are more the people that that all of us are looking for. Where yes, if somebody is 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 interested enough in that first level, just bullshit kind of product, then that's fine. That might just need to go through that, get it out of their system, waste a couple hundred dollars, and get nowhere. And then and then be like, okay, maybe I should actually look into this a little bit more and see um, who is promoting things. Uh, what's different? Like I, I, now when somebody tells me swallow these pills and lose any amount of weight, I'm going to be immediately skeptical. But if this person over here is telling me that supplements are supplementary by definition, you actually don't need them at all. And when we're talking about weight loss, here's what drives it and getting them more into that learning process, then um, it, it allows me to create a more meaningful connection with those people and right. it does turn off people, though. There are people like I, I know from heat maps, for example, most people don't even make it to the halfway mark on my sales pages. Uh, even a lot of people who buy, you know, they, they read enough where they're like, all right, whatever. This sounds good enough. I'm buying. But uh, there are a lot of people, though, who, who do appreciate the long form education and then they can find their way into my books and articles and podcasts. And so I've really built my personal brand and a major part of Legion's USP is that education point. Um, and so that's why I've 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 done it that way. I love it. And um, you have to take that ball and run with it, if you don't mind, I think. The, the fundamental nature of what a consumer can be educated with has changed. Uh, and I think you, you talked about a couple things that are important there. The sophistication is not necessarily just due to a, uh, an unintelligent uh, you know, consumer base. I think a large part of it was that there simply were not things like Examen or Legion or De Novo or or, or uh, Citadel also did a lot of work uh, trying to actually educate people who came to their sites. Um, and that has changed. I think when you have a certain high-level barrier of entry, like before, back in the day, if you wanted to be an informed consumer of supplements, you would have to start reading PubMed articles. Or, or at kind of the lowest barrier to entry, you'd need to go on the bodybuilding.com forums. Oh, you nailed it. Yeah, exactly, yeah. right? And then we would have to um, talk to the people on there who knew better and then also yeah. navigate the fact that there were a ton of conflicts of interest because there were people um, who knew this and they would create board reps. There was a time back in 05, <laughs> briefly, where I was an epic nutrition board rep. Um, and this was before I knew anything. And I was just like, well, the pathway for a bodybuilder to get some kind of income is to get a supplement sponsor. Yeah. And I think that was just... The ethics of it weren't even considered at that time. Um, it was just like, you know, what can I do? Uh, and and I think you, you had this, that was probably where you could get more useful information, but the barrier of assessing who is being uh, non-conflicted, non-biased in their interpretation, uh, you have to assess two different smart people talking to each other, um, look at the studies they post, read the abstracts because you don't have full text access and just try to figure it all out. Which is not, it's uh, just not possible as a layman. That's just, that's actually not possible. Not. I mean, it's, it's like trying to sort through the climate change debate. Good luck. Good luck when you start looking into the scientific arguments made on both sides, where you get to a point where you're like, I don't understand half the words they're saying anymore. I actually don't know. And so yeah. it's the same, the same phenomenon in, in supplementation. That's very true. And I think now that uh, examine.com, I, I, honestly, I just can't give enough credit to examine. Um, I give that out. And anyone who's not checked it out, if you're listening to the podcast, check out examine.com. It's basically the Wikipedia of supplements. So, and, and resources like that and the, the work you guys have all done are great examples of how we've lowered 
uh, that we, you guys have lowered the barrier for, for what uh, can be done to, to get this information. I think that's changed the face of consumers for the better. And um, I think one thing that you've all brought up is you haven't necessarily always made the best business decisions, but it's been not me. In, no, <laughs> well, I, well, to be honest, I know Omar and Ben. I guarantee you, they haven't always made the best business oh, decisions no, I, either. I have, I have some <laughs> still fighting myself. I have some good blunders too. Yeah, but I, I what I will say is that um, some of the 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 unwillingness to make some of the concessions that other companies do has resulted in a more informed consumer base and long term a greater income potential for all three of you. I'll give you an example. Like you brought up Optimum Nutrition. They're known as producing high quality supplements. They're not great, but they've always, but, but you know what you get is probably what's on the label. But one thing that Optimum Nutrition is very willing to do is if they see a lot of people buying glutamine, they see a lot of people buying branched chain amino acids, even if the research basis isn't necessarily there, they're going to keep making those products and then keep positioning those products in the way that will keep them is the number one product that I get asked, hey, when are you going to make a BCA? And I explain to people why. Actually, I'm probably going to make like, it's going to be a joke category of product on, in, the, in the store of stuff I don't, we don't have, right? And it's going to be explaining why we don't. But um, be, and I'll explain to people, oh, here's why. And still, I've had a number of people like semi-regularly say, well, yeah, but basically it's tasty water. Like I understand, but I still am going to buy it. I'm still going to drink it. And if you were to make it, I would buy yours. And uh, like, unfortunately, <laughs> that's, that's not yeah. a very good sales pitch. Like this basically does nothing is good for nobody under any circumstances other than maybe extreme weird outlier uh, yeah. people. Uh, but, you know, here, buy it if you like tasty water. Yeah. And I think I think now that you have a more informed consumer base, seeing that type of messaging that you guys put out, um, there is now this contrast that didn't previously exist. You know, before it was just about who actually produced supplements that that did the, that that were actually what the label claimed, and whose marketing feels the least icky. You know, um, so anyway, so on that topic, um, Omar, I want to ask you about some of the challenges trying to come into this space at the time point you did, because you're kind of the, I think I think you might be the latest one in, into the space, and I know that you were trying to find a way, like you said. You felt there was space to do this um, and that you, you could provide value. What, what were some of the, the stumbling blocks that, that were in your way? Eric, just uh, before we go on, I'm, I'm embarrassed by a, a, an earlier conversation because Mike was mentioning how there was that author, John Locke, that's publishing you know, books of a uh, potentially scandalous, uh, scintillating variety. And uh, mm. I should just come clean that I actually have been publishing under an alias, um, T. Hobbs, and the number one bestseller, the romance novel, would be Leviathan. It's uh, a, <laughs> it's very erotic. <laughs> it's about a Hobbs monster. And Locke. You, you yeah. know what's going to be the natural product of this conversation is uh, a romance novel and aphrodisiac stack. That's what's happening. I, I feel like. We'll just make our own company of the four of us. We'll call it the four and they, of and they, co they come together. It, that's the, that's <laughs> yeah. it, it truly is. It's a stack. You get the book. That's a great and then, play on words too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. <laughs> no. And, and then it's all dependent on, on, on your perspective on whether, you know, what, what's, what's humans base nature on mm -hmm. whether they, they, they need to be self-organized or, or organized out, outside of them. I think uh, it's a tough twist, but anyway, tell me more about your romance obsession and, and mm -hmm. finish your, your, uh, your, oh, your, the supplements? your confessionary. Ah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That so, minor, minor detail. Plot, plot, I, plot. I think <laughs> sometimes having a certain level of ignorance can be a very good thing because I, when Gnosis and now Ouroboros, when we started, I had a few assumptions, a few working assumptions that I wanted to follow through. And one of the first ones uh, would be essentially that people are smarter than most marketing companies, most supplement companies realize. And actually, Greg Knuckles had a recent article that I just found myself nodding to, where he spoke about the idea that people know, by and large, when they're being marketed to, that they're smarter mm -hmm. than people, once again, would assume. So we want to just lower that right out of the gate keep the transparency high. And what I like about what Ben said, uh, what Mike said, it's not like we're trying to virtue signal here, right? Like the, the whole concept, I would say that uh, virtue is what you do behind closed doors. Everything else is marketing. So it's not like we're the good guys, you know, we're fighting the good fight. It's I want to do this because I'm comfortable with it. I want to do something that I can stand behind 110%. So there's a few assumptions uh, uh, moving forward. And then I would say with Ouroboros, a few others would be that we would want to decrease the knowledge asymmetry that historically has 
existed mm-hmm. in the supplement industry and propagated by the supplement industry, right? So they're they're purposely trying to mislead consumers. They want you to buy X product. They probably know, they likely know, like the the, uh, the formulators, those at the top of the chain know as uh, kind of what I think Mike said, that glutamine or whatever, insert X supplement, it doesn't really do anything, but it's a good seller. So they're going to keep selling it. And their job is to is to try and convince you that you continue to need said supplement. So they're increasing the knowledge asymmetry. And with all the fancy marketing, all the things uh, playing upon human emotions, they could succeed at that. So we wanted to decrease that. And that's been obviously one of the major drivers of the content on YouTube. And then lastly, I would say, before uh, we go on, Another assumption or another thing that I started with was design by subtraction was the essential concept of Ouroboros, where it's what are the base things that we need? What are the quintessential elements that would make Ouroboros what it is? So we came up with evidence base, the transparency, even the label and the branding, where it's almost like the anti-brand. And that leans into some of the things that I had done previously with all the YouTube content, seeing what the space was like, what I'd be comfortable with where I thought there was potential and what people most importantly, we kind of speak about this often in our own culture, the intersection between what you think is important, what you think should be said, and then how to say it in a way that people would understand. Um, so there's actually a, a lot of levels of opposition when you start with that, when you want to begin, right? So it's like, well, where do you get the money? Uh, how do you do this? How do you do that? How do you get it out to people? Forchi from uh, the, the whole concept of not selling out in quotations, I could define what that means through years and years of putting out content. It was relatively easy to pitch the new concept of the supplement or the line that I had to my audience because they had built up a level of uh, trust, rapport over time. They know they could validate because now, once again, due to things like examine.com or a variety of other factors, they could kind of fact check you. You know, before, like 10 years ago, I'm the guru, right? What I say is that top down hierarchy. Uh, what I say goes. And so, some of the initial hurdles that we had to overcome was trying to figure our space, kind of like what Ben was saying, where for him, it's it's partially a creative element where essentially, if you're all just offering evidence-based supplements and the base level of what you're offering, it's a fight to the bottom dollar, right? If all marketing is the same, so let's just say if everyone has the same level of marketing, so figuring out how things fit in. So we were playing around with that for actually quite some time. Uh, the oppositions that we face would actually just be more supply chain. So the idea that we would order a certain amount and because we were selling and not to get into too many details, we had a lower profit margin. And again, I was comfortable with that because I knew what I wanted with this. And this was, I kind of hate, not when people say passion, a driven project, but it wasn't profit first. Profit is a variable that we're certainly considering, but it's okay if I take a look at Ouroboros after the first year, I'm like, how much money did we make? Ooh, that much, you know, it's not going to make or break everything else that I'm doing. It's not the line share what I'm trying to focus on. Uh, but because of that, because of the price point, we had determined and what I felt comfortable on the variety of factors as people kept ordering it, uh, because we weren't charging double what it cost us. And because it was uh, being ordered at a certain amount, we ran into quickly some supply chain issues that massively delayed. And we lost not a massive amount of steam, but once again, because people want to buy it, they can't buy it anymore. It's been delayed with the manufacturer that we're going uh, with at the time, it's probably going to be at least three months. We're talking closer to five months because there's some very specific things, even in terms of the fillers that we added and what we didn't add, that it would take a while. So we had a hot product that came out of the gate. People believed the hype. They got their first batch. They want more. And then we just have five months of nothing. Uh, so that that was mm-hmm. rough and something we had to fix. And then once again, as the momentum was being established, then what we had, we had that situation with that Italian company where once again, no shade, but it, it, it is what it is, where we had to shut down. And so once we shut down, we had to get rid of the inventory, which we were able to successfully do. But then we had we were going back and forth with that company, so we couldn't rebrand uh, right out of the gate. So there's large gaps. There's basically in the three year history, there's probably a five month gap between the launch, the initial order, and then the next available time, which was terrible. And then a year after that, there was about a, another four to five month gap of when we had to switch uh, the company, rebrand, and do all those sorts of things. So those would be for me the two biggest hurdles per se of Ouroboros. Is what I'd say. That totally makes sense, man. And I think um, <clears throat> the bit of the look behind the curtain is a, is a really cool thing because I know um, what I where I relate to all of you, even though I'm obviously not in the, in the supplement industry myself, is trying to, like you said, Omar, decrease the knowledge asymmetry. Um, one thing that I've committed to in the last, I'd say, year and a half, I've really thought about it, is every time I have the opportunity to, to try to, when I do publish an article that is in the true scientific Uh, literature, not something I'd write for 3DMJ or a blog or something for mass, to do it in an open access journal 
and to, to write it in, in the way that it'll still get through peer review, but that is as least jargony as possible and hopefully understood. Um, because I think that's, that's kind of where the initial seed gets planted for our community. And then people take that and communicate it. And we have this space uh, that's been created by what I would describe as the ivory tower of, of science. That's um, unfortunate. Like, like it doesn't really bother me that, you know, an astrophysicist, you know, we need, we need people like, you know, like Bill Nye, the science guy or whatever to communicate that because it is truly beyond most people's intellectual capacity to fully understand. But applied nutrition science, you don't need to know the biochemistry to simply know in an applied study of these, uh, you know, chicks and dudes who lift weights, did they actually get a benefit that was greater than not taking the supplement if they took a placebo? That's a pretty simple study. Um, but the accessibility of it has always been so poor. So any, anyway, the, the, the kind of the, the role I've always tried to play is, is to take that information, create it, I would also communicate it and try to actually enact change. So that's why I've, I've really appreciated the opportunity to collaborate with all three of you. Like, like, uh, like Mike was saying, um, you know, being on the board and then I go, okay, well, I'm also a nutrition researcher, so I need to keep myself from being conflicted. And here's another example of what may not be the best business decision or what I wouldn't expect from like an optimum nutrition is I said, Hey Mike, that's fine. But a, I can't get paid, which I'm sure he was like, well, that's fine. I, I don't, I don't mind not giving you money, but then I keep, also keep said, going. <laughs> yeah, this, this is great. I'm loving this deal. But then I also said, Hey, I want to be able to keep making content for DeNovo. I want to keep consulting with Omar. And I also want to keep consulting with, with Citadel. And at the time, having them sponsor my athletes at 3DMJ. And he was like, yeah, no problem. And I was like, oh, you know, I kind of expected this to be a deal breaker. So it's, it's I think what, what speaks to, you know, you're all individuals and all the companies have a very distinct feel, which I love. But I can tell that the, the motivation behind each one, like you said, is not purely profit driven. It's value driven which hopefully results in long-term profit. But what I really love is just how each one of you, while there has been challenges, which we're going to keep diving into, has helped change the actual space of, the, of where you're, you're, you're selling your own, your own products. You, you've changed the market in such a way that is favorable for you and beneficial to the consumer, which I think is just really cool. So that's kind of what was going on in my head as you guys were both talking. So let's, let's continue hearing about the, the horror stories of of, of, of this process of starting up one of these companies. Ben, um, you know, in my observation of DeNovo over the last, what is almost 10 years? Is that right? It's been that there's almost been like three-ish eras, at least to the outside viewer uh, of, of the company. Can you walk us through what these have been like and, and, and how sometimes you've been maybe hanging by your, your fingernails on, on, the, on the cliff face? Yeah. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, that's, that's more... More often than I'd like to admit, uh, it happens. But um, so originally, when I started the company, um, it was it, it's hard to even call it a business. It was kind of a passion project. I, I really was losing money uh, making products, kind of like um, like Mike said when he was selling books. I was just happy that people wanted to try my product, and it, it like the reward was almost getting positive feedback. Like that felt so good. I was like, well, fuck it, this is worth it. Um, and I, I had, I had the job at the time. I wasn't really making that well of money, but like I said, it was just like, wow, I'm actually doing this thing. And I think I was surviving on that emotional energy of it. Um, and then it came to a point where I realized to really grow and make more products and, and do more. You, you have to have money. If you, it, it's like the, the reality is, is profit and finances are the the blood that circulates the metaphorical body if you don't have the blood you you just die you don't feed your brain you die um and i think uh, that very much i i've noticed that very much happens so as as i wanted it to start as a passion project it needed it needed to grow and expand out and i needed business help and i realized that as someone who's really approaching this from a purely uh scientific angle there's a lot of uh things i'm missing in in building as a business and an operation. So actually through through both the bodyblind.com forums and Lane's VIP camps, I, I met people. I met Ryan Doris um, and then one of his friends and we partnered, uh, moved to Florida, actually got a, a, a warehouse, um, like a small warehouse. We basically scaled up the cement mixer uh, operation. So we got three cement mixers. Um, and triple the manufacturing size. Yeah. Well, here's here's the here's <laughs> the really crazy growth. part. 
So mm-hmm. my, my dad is, is a, is a contractor. So, um, it, and, and the theme of all of this is, is resourcefulness. Like you have to, you have to do it or you just don't survive. So my dad flew down for a weekend. He built us a mezzanine, which is basically a second floor where you can gravity feed product down from a mixer. So he built us this, this whole second floor. We cut a hole in it. I built this big funnel system, like literally a, a three foot diameter funnel uh, and found a way to bolt it together onto this big plastic food grade tube. So what we do is we'd mix, uh, we'd dump it into the big funnel. It would feed down into a hopper and then we could gravity feed and fill each bag. Um, so that existed as, as the operation for, uh, for a while, but we were collectively, all of us were dying. Cause it's like, when you do have a big scaled operation, like these big private manufacturers or these people who have a big facility, you can kind of pump it out in an assembly line. Like one person operates one thing, but when you're standing for eight to 10 hours, like it's brute, like we'd come home and like, literally it, like it felt so blue collar. Like we'd be like, man, we got to get drunk or something. Cause it was just <laughs> that, that brutal of, of backbreaking, um, work. Uh, so I think the major challenge wasn't just the scaling it in terms of getting people to recognize and realize we exist, but also to keep up with the demand and not crush ourselves. Cause at this point it's really four people who are manning mm-hmm. uh, entire things. And then really trying to figure out all of these vendors who make bags, who make packaging, who make labels, who, uh, who can supply you with the right raw materials. That's better than X, Y, Z raw materials. Um, so finding sourcing and, and, uh, and yeah, all of that stuff. So, uh, during that period of time, we did find a private manufacturer. We were able to get that part off of our, um, off of kind of our back, literally and, and metaphorically. Um, and then I think the difficulty of, of a partnership is you, you have to be on the same page and you almost think that in the beginning when there's there's nothing to fight for. It's going to stay that same way. Like everybody's in the trenches. And unfortunately, as something grows really quick, it, things, things change and, 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 and life changes. And, uh, a big thing is like, um, I, I think a lot from the manual labor and from the lifting that, you know, I was, I was doing experimentally, uh, my health situation changed and I needed to leave and that changed everything basically. Um, so we had private manufacturer. I left Florida. I brought everything back to my house, my parents' house, started doing fulfillment out of there, dissolved the partnership, crazy. Then within a a span of two, three months, uh, our protein manufacturer starts doing something off on the QC. The protein smells like wood wood chips. Um, It tastes off. uh, So that pretty much goes to shit. Then our manufacturer for Utopia, which was our best-selling product at the time, uh, they start burning the seals on the line. So our stuff that's going out to people is getting, it's burnt on the top. So people are getting little black, you know, like carbon chips in there. Like I realize people don't, people don't want the, uh, carbon, uh, carbon flavor. The, yeah. The, the ergogenic <laughs> effects of, uh, of, of charcoal. Um, so, so was, 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 was that Lane's product when he came out with carbon for a while? Was it that he had little carbon <laughs> chips? And that the was same? the problem. Just burning toast and <laughs> everything's just charcoal flavor. <laughs> Who would have uh, thought? <laughs> yeah, so so that was really midpoint of craziness. That's when I started to lose my hair. So now, as you can see, there's none left. So uh, I made it, it through, uh, not unscathed. Um, so uh, was it the creatine? Yeah, yeah, right. Stress uh, and creatine, the ma- the magic hair yeah, formula. The, the, yeah, the uh, synergy. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, that that part went completely crazy. And then, then we switched, we went on to Amazon to try to get that market because we realized that so many more people are, are buying on, on Amazon. We get on there, uh, three months later, they decide they're going to start, uh, closing the categories where you have to apply to, to be approved. They denied us three times. They, They told us that whenever we, uh, submitted a application, they said, we can't tell you why we're denying you because it's proprietary to our business model. So they had all of our inventory. They took down our listings. We had no inventory to sell. We finally got them to send our stuff back. They sent back 20% of it damaged, no ability to get recoup that, that, that cost. 
So, you know, this is like the third time I'm thinking, shit, this is over. Like, how, how am I going to, you know, sustain this? Uh, so fulfillment comes back to me. Uh, I get fulfillment. Our, I get this little office space where I'm able to have a lab in the front where I could basically do QC and science projects. The back part is our, our storage and inventory, which I'm shipping out of. Uh, the roof starts leaking. Uh, so then I need to go in like two o'clock in the morning, cover everything with the tarp so nothing gets wet. It's like, it's never ending. So basically the entire theme of all of this is like, the challenges don't, don't stop and they, they tend to get bigger as the, the company scales. And that's just like the personal struggles. I think the other end of it is kind of like Omar talked about as well is um, when you're dealing with manufacturers, if you're not the one making the product, they are going to prioritize you on a tier of how much money you're bringing into them. And mm -hmm. you can't say that if, you know, GNC says, I want a million units of this, and you say, I want a thousand of this, that you're going to, you know, take priority over, you know, GNC or, or whatever company is coming in and competing for that interest. So you deal with that, you deal with um, the, the scalability of everything. Uh, it's just like Walmart and Amazon. Why can they sell stuff cheaper than anybody else? Because they can buy it in higher volume. So if you're starting out uh, and you can only hit the threshold of minimum, uh, you're going to pay a lot more per unit. That means that's going to kill your profit margin. And I think the the additional challenge of that is to make a product that's actually legitimate and not see dusted across, across, you know, all these ingredients that hit the check mark of, oh, I should be looking for that. Good. But you're actually putting it in a dose that does something. Um, the challenge you reach is now you have multiple things working against you. You can't hit the volume that gives you a better price you're using expensive ingredients that also are dosed right. So that hikes up or inflates your cost. So there's so many things working against you. Um, and then again, like, like Omar said, when we did have these periods of waves of popularity um, where like uh, someone mentioned uh, Utopia on Tim Ferriss's podcast and we had a, it was actually Dom D'Agostino. I know, I know you know who he is, Eric. Yeah, um, I do. And we blew up like overnight from that. And then we sold out and we couldn't get restocked quick enough. So it's like we lost that that because it was five, six week span where uh, we missed that window and we didn't know because how can you prepare for something you don't know? And if you don't have the money uh, ahead of time to buy enough inventory in advance, it, it's, you know, so th there's there's so many, many multiple challenges of it that, like I said, just don't stop. And then when the industry progresses, like Optimum and all these brands starting to do the informed sport and the checkmark thing, people, the consumer doesn't understand that that's an added cost. Like, yeah. You're paying to get that check mark, just like you're paying to do additional QC testing beyond just microbial. You're doing QC testing for um, for quantitation, for potency. Um, you're doing it for if you want to do independent third party, you're going to pay to have something scanned through the profile of banned substances, even if you don't get the water check mark. The water check marks an additional cost on top of it. So when you add in all of these things and you don't have the ability to do high volume, it's very hard to dilute that, that cost per unit without doing an enormous volume. Um, so I, I don't know, maybe I gave people anxiety just from all the factors that you need to consider, but it, it's like uh, it, every day I, I, I feel like I, I, I'm panicked about what am I forgetting or what am I missing that, that could sink the ship. Uh, and, and then on top of it, you're talking about staff costs. So if, if you can't, so let's say you make a product and you, you are confident you make, let's say you make the perfect product. That's great. If, if people don't realize that that's a great product, who the fuck is going to buy it? If mm. so, if you, if only, you know, it's a great product, what do you just have a store of a thousand units for the next decade for yourself? Like you're making no profit. You're just losing money. So you need to be able to pay for the staff to help market it, the graphic designer, the to make labels look pretty so you can engage people visually. So it's like there are so many moving parts to compete in an industry that drives so hard on Instagram, which is a visual marketplace. If you can't keep up there and get eyes and get consumers, it, it's it's challenging on another level. Um, because in in this round table we're having, I feel like we can collectively all realize what not to look for and what to look for. The average consumer like we've said numerous times is like they probably know beta alanine i should probably be looking for that creatine i should probably be looking for that okay 
Well, let's just, oh, this has that and it's the cheapest price. Boom, click it, prime. I get it quickest. Awesome. I'm, I'm happy now. The fear has been quenched. You know, I'm going to make my, my maximized gains. Um, so I think that's, that's another facet is the cost of education to the consumer to help them realize why you're different, how you're different, and why they should care. Um, because I feel like unless you get popped as a tested athlete, you don't really care. You just price search. You, you look for the cheapest thing. Oh, protein's protein. Okay. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's got nitrogen in it. I just want to improve my nitrogen balance full. Fine. I'll just pick the cheapest thing. Um, and then they get popped a couple months later for testing positive for a SARM. And it's like, uh, it's weird. Like I do think the supplement company should bear a large responsibility, but so does the consumer too. Um, cause if you're keeping these brands afloat and not asking for more, it's, you know, it's like there, there is part responsibility on, on your behalf. And, and I think the thing that has come up numerous times in this conversation as well is, and I could realize this and I've realized it and I like the challenge of it, but at the same time, I'm constantly infuriated by it is, um, the, it is some level of sacrifice when you have a life, a family, kids, relationships to spend four or five hours a day researching effective supplements and reading PubMed just about supplements. If you're an athlete and you just want to improve athletic performance, um, that that's a, a lot to ask of people. Um, and that's a very hard thing to overcome when what's the quickest way to get to someone's attention is an emotional appeal and really good marketing that just tells them what they want to hear and enough science that says, I believe that. Um, so it's like, I feel like we've gotten to this outlier place of you learn a lot of how to segregate bad products from good products. But once you're so far over here, it's how do you not lose touch with the consumer who's still kind of back here in terms of how much they know and how much they want to know. Um, so I think every person individually or every brand owner or formulator needs to decide for themselves, how do I bridge that gap? And for me, I look at it as I want to be able to have a conversation with you through chemistry. So I want you to feel something that we can share this experience where we don't even need words to communicate it. So you felt something unique that you haven't felt before. I know why that happened. You don't need to know why that happened, but I know it's not going to make you test positive. And I know that it's going to be something different and unique that separates. And uh, if we can't do that, I don't want to run De Novo anymore. Um, mm. But uh, it is, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a challenge to juggle all of the elements of owning and running a company, interpersonal, manufacturers, vendors, um, and then, and then marketing and education. It, it's, it's a lot, if it sounded like a lot, um, I hope that came across somewhat understandably, cause I know it was like all over the place, but literally that's kind of where my mind is every day. It's like, oh shit, I have my own mortgage payments and stuff to take care of, but wait, hold on. The company needs this company first. <laughs> uh, so yeah, you do, you make sacrifices. No, I, uh, I, I think it came across very clear. Uh, I think you did a really good job of putting the listener in the state of stress that you must be in on, on a very regular <laughs> basis. Um, I actually ordered yeah. some blood pressure medicine on my phone <laughs> while listening to you. Um, but then I, I realized that I needed a doctor's script. So I just went to so the cheapest supplement website I could find and something that <laughs> promised to lower my blood pressure. You got some, some grapeseed uh, extract instead. Yeah, we're good to go. I've got a tested uh, competition I'm doing in April. I'm sure everything will go fine. So... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, if, if you see me fail a drug test in April, you know why. Thanks, Ben. Yep. Um, no, no, I think that that's man, that's really insightful. Now, now think, you start using the drugs because you've set up the excuse. You know what I mean? Exactly. That that's yeah. that's that's the uh, that's, that's the what key. the oh was that grape seed? I was talking about this like say you know months ago. See, yep. that's why I pop positive for having fourteen different antibiotic steroids <laughs> in my system. <laughs> it was really tainted. Man, it was these, actually yeah, these GMOs they're growing the plants with. I didn't realize yes, SARMs are actually see? applicable to. Yeah, I, bug, I want bugs, my bugs wheat. Don't like them, you know. <laughs> yeah. I, I want my wheat to have trenbolone in it. Uh, that's the kind of GMO I want. I need testes on my shafts of wheat. That's what I need. All right. So, no, but seriously, Ben, I think that was, um, we're definitely going to have to come back around for some of the silver linings, because uh, most people are probably, you know, never want to do anything except just hide in their house and cry after that. But um, but it was honest, and I appreciate that. Mike well, Matthews, my yeah. friend, 
uh, what are, what are some of the challenges? I know you've talked you talked a fair bit about a, kind of the whole the whole picture, but any, any specific challenges that you've faced to try to be successful with Legion? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I would say so. The so the any business grows. I mean, according to who you who you listen to, right? So the different phases of business. Some people, I think, there's a general agreement that like getting to your first million dollar uh, in sa- first million dollars in sales. And, and then being able to do that annually, that that is a unique challenge and requires certain things then. And then getting to, uh, I read a book recently, the next big breakthrough um, they were talking about in that book is, is the 10 million a year uh, range and how the business changes beyond that. And so, um, and then from there, apparently it's in the mid twenties. And, and so going back all the way to the beginning, in the, the, the inventory thing. So, 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 um, in 2013, we, we took some pre-orders at the end of the year for what was coming in 2014. Right. And the pre-orders did fine. And I wasn't sure I just wanted to gauge demand and see how people were going to respond to this. Right. And I, maybe we did $40,000 in pre-orders, something like that, um, which was cool. And, and then we get into 2014, everything's live and it's doing well. And somewhere along the way, I realized like, wait a minute, we haven't reordered yet. Are we, who's looking at inventory? Like (laughs) what's going on right now? And, and then uh, lo and behold, nobody was really paying attention to inventory. And so we'd run out of stock of of everything right in the first year. And that, that was a, a moment where I was like, wow. And I, and I thought I was kind of a smart guy sometimes, but, uh, that's a pretty obvious oversight. Um, and, and so we were out of stock for, I think it was about a month or so we were out of stock of everything come back in though, fine and learn our lesson and put actual systems in place. Um, again, looking back, I guess we were probably just like, like Ben and Omar, you're just excited. People are buying your stuff. You're like, that's cool. And, and for some reason I hadn't really looked too far beyond that. I mean, I, I guess like, like both you guys have talked about the, there's a lot of things going on every day and a lot of things to do. And somehow that got missed. Um, but, but the, the first year, uh, Legion did, did quite well, did about 1.4 million in sales, uh, its first year. And so, and then from there it, it grew very quickly, uh, exponentially for the next couple of years. And so the the challenges were really kind of how to, keeping up with business now that is quickly becoming an established that needs systems that needs employees uh, and something that I didn't even necessarily I don't like running a business even now there's there's maybe thirty of us all of us together I honestly don't like running a business very much uh, mostly because I don't like managing people uh, I like doing my own work. And that's just, that's just my personality. And I think I've done, I've, I've had that's a challenge for me personally, I've had to overcome is, um, is, is that element of, in some ways I, I was maybe a decent leader in that I set a good example. I work hard and we've always had integrity and there's a bit of a vision there. But again, my interpersonally, I'm an, a, I'm, I'm an acquired taste. I'll put it that way, where I can be brusque and, I wouldn't make a good politician. Um, and, and so, uh, I've, I've had to, I've had to, to, it's just educating myself on like business structure and, uh, how do you, how do you create a culture that, that people actually want to participate in? Um, and, um, so, so that, that would, that's been, that's been, I guess has required some personal growth. Uh, I can't, I can't get into too many details on it, but I, I, let's just say there are some people who I should not have worked with, uh, and who were, were just way more trouble than they were worth, uh, in, in the end. And it cost me a bit of money to fix that situation. And mm. it was, it wasn't tremendously stressful personally. It was, it was very annoying and it was, it was a distraction and a waste of time. And it was something that I, I let it go on for too long. Like there was a point where it was just like, Oh no, this, this has to end now. Like this has to change. And I wanted to believe otherwise. And I wanted to try to make it work. And, um, 
and so I, I, I just kind of prolonged the, the suffering, so to speak, and, and the organizational problems that come with that too. Again, when you have some people who are not aligned with the rest of the company and who are really just becoming a camouflaged hole in the company, uh, and you don't address it, not only does that harm the company, obviously, but it also undermines me, undermines the, the person in charge who's supposed to fix this shit. Like everyone else is trying to do their jobs. And then there are these other people who are uh, not willing to pull their weight and, or even actively working to undermine growth. And more and more people are starting to realize that, but it's literally like a cancer. It, yeah, it, if exactly. You don't address it. It grows. It's I, very true. And yep. so I, I, in the end, it didn't, it didn't, uh, it didn't obviously wreck the wreck the, the company. It cost me a fair amount of growth though. I'll say that if I would have addressed this when I first saw, when I was like, oh, that's not good. Like this is, here's a preview of, of what's to come. I should just get ahead of this right now. Um, and, and if I would have done that when it would have been appropriate, I honestly do think Legion would be double its current size right now. That's that's how much it has cost me in terms of potential. And that that's just my subject subjective opinion. But it's based on on what we're doing now. There are there's there are a lot of strategic initiatives that just didn't happen because of, of these people that really could have happened. It just required work. It didn't require brilliance. Like most things, just just consistently being not stupid, right? That's it. That's all we have to do to live a good life. Honestly, that's my opinion. We don't need to be geniuses. We don't need to have eureka moments. We just have to be consistently not dumb. And uh, so given like what could have gotten done in terms of uh, to put exact like, okay, so we recently six months or so launched a rewards program where people get essentially 5% cash back. And, and they get it in points and they can apply it toward future orders. Um, that, it, the data, to get a full customer lifetime value, uh, it takes about a year of data. And so we're not there yet, but the data that we have, I wanna say again, about six months of data suggests that the LTV of people who participate in the rewards program, which is most people, is about 50%. It's, it looks like it's gonna be 30 to 50%, let's say, so cut it in the middle, 40% higher Lifetime value, meaning how much a customer's worth, you know, how much they spend before they disappear. Um, then, then the people who who are not participating or previously when we didn't have it, um, subscription, subscribe and save, ten uh, percent, for example. We just launched that. That's been a thing forever. Like, and mm -hmm. especially when you when 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 you have uh, in Legion's in Legion's case, a lot of customers. It's it's it's. Just, uh, it's it makes no sense. It's, it's terrible business to not have this and to go for years of like doing millions of dollars of sales. Yet, you know, people are like manually subscribing and not saving. <laughs> That's like where you're at. You're incentivizing them to go to Amazon, which is, as you guys know, Ben and Omar, the whole the at least one of my primary focuses strategically is how do I and that's why I wanted the rewards program subscribe and save we're doing a whole rebrand redesign because our stuff looks way too masculine and bodybuilderish and ugly and I hate it uh and I'm offended <laughs> I mean, I'm not I'm not trying to sell you supplements though so I guess that's okay uh, that's, uh, that's fine that's fine <laughs> um no no I know you're joking and and anyway so so there are a number of these things that just didn't get done over the course of years. Like the company should be as a system should be far more sophisticated than it, than it is. And particularly the marketing. Right. And so, so that was an expensive, truly expensive lesson to learn in the money I had to actually pay and the realization that like, wow, things could be a lot further than they currently are if I would have done something about it. And, uh, ironically though, every, I mean, I, maybe I could find the exception, but the rule is, and I've met a lot of successful business people over the years, they all have stories like this. They all have stories of the, the people that they shouldn't have tied themselves to, right? And Ben, you mentioned a partnership. Anybody listening, think of a partnership like a marriage. That's how you have to think of it. Are you willing to marry this person? And, and you don't marry someone unless you are, uh, I mean, you can take the romantic element out of it in the business partnership, but like, 
you have to be enthusiastic about spending the rest of your life together. You, it's almost like you pay for an expensive life, life lesson because you can look back and say, you know, it's like hindsight's twenty twenty. If I didn't do this, if I saw it, if I approached it or, you know, resolved it earlier. I think the reality, though, is if if you go ahead in life and automatically jump too quick on your intuition, you can also shut off or close good opportunities. And like so it's like finding that balance between keeping the right amount of open of openness, but not ignoring uh, like a an accrual of, yes, yes. you know, gut punches. Right. Um, but every I, I totally, every day is not a new day. It's yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? Today yeah. is not the day this person's going to change when now yes. there's like two years of evidence that has accumulated of what's going on here and where this is likely to go. And I, and I totally agree with you. Um, I just, I think that my, one of my personal goals in business is to learn as, to learn as little hard lessons from experience or as few hard lessons from experience as possible, right? Especially stupid shit that I could just read in a book and or speak to I wouldn't say I've ever really had any mentors, but speak to to smart business people, very sexy who who along the way had told me like, oh, yeah, those people, you should just get rid of it. Like, it's never going to work. I'm just telling you, like right now, stop thinking about it. Stop trying to fix it. It's not going to work. Trust me, I've been there. And I ignored a couple of those uh, of those warnings. And so, you know, we can. We, yes, we can afford to make a lot of mistakes in life and still have a good life, but we can only afford to make so many. And there are certain mistakes we can't afford to make. And so or the catastrophic ones. Yeah, and exactly. And that's and, and that if I wouldn't have addressed that, it would have be it would have become one of those catastrophic who knows where it would have went type of things. And fortunately, it all it all worked out, I would say, very much in my favor. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I can't go into too many details, but. It, and now it's fine. But, you know, I, I totally uh, agree that you have to and that's where intuition comes in. Right. And that's this is something that I talk about. Uh, I have on my podcast, I do like a, a book review once a month and it's really just stuff I'm reading and stuff. It's not it's rarely health and fitness. Uh, sometimes it is, but there aren't very many good health and fitness books out there. In my opinion, you read a handful and it's hard to find at least mainstream. Like go to the bookstore and try to find a fitness book that any of you guys want to read. Yeah, you won't. Um, you can find some self-published stuff, maybe um, like Eric's books. And, uh, but, Stop. Uh, but, you know, it, it is tough. Go look in Barnes and Noble, right? And yeah. uh, anyway, so so I, I talk about why I think it is, it's utterly crucial to continue educating yourself. And if you want to get into business, to educate yourself about business, because it's not what you can remember. Right. So, you know, I could talk about a bunch of business books I've read, maybe remember some details, some interesting things, whatever. But I truly do believe that by accumulating information, there's a subconscious uh, there's 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 there is some sort of retention and and that your intuition does improve and that you if, if you're more educated, you will naturally make better decisions in an area, even if you can't explain why. Even if you're faced with a situation, right, and you have to make a decision and, you know, life is an IQ test, right? Business, any of these things is just problems to solve, puzzles to figure out. And if you're like faced with these circumstances, this is what I think is right. You may not even be able to articulate, maybe if you really sat and thought about it, but that is 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 very important in business, I think, in being able to develop that intuitive sense of what are good marketing decisions, because marketing also is a... There is it very much relies on your ability to uh, put yourself in somebody else's shoes and see the world through their eyes and speak in the words that they use and and um, see how they see you. Right. And, and how how you see yourself and how you see your business and how you see its mission. None of that matters. All that matters is what does the other person see? And what do they want to see and what do they want to hear and how you've, you were talking about this, Ben, and how do you connect those things? Right. Um, so 
anyways, those, those, those were some, some issues last year. Again, I probably can't get into too many details, but had, uh, an Amazon snafu of my own that was, <laughs> was and now fun, this is, they? this is, no, this is normal. Actually. Like if you're not having at least one major problem with Amazon per year, you're either not making any money on Amazon or you're like Jeff Bezos's cousin or something. <laughs> and really, I know that that sounds like a joke, but it actually is true. Although I am going to, I am going to give Amazon some credit. It, it looks like that that may be changing. Actually, that would that was absolutely the case a couple of years ago. Listings go up and down. You know, Ben it, it, and Omar. I don't know if you sold on Amazon, but that's the game, dude. You like one day you're number one pre workout, making a bunch of money every day, and then the next day your product is down, gone. You don't know why, and it takes you a month to like ever even find out, let alone get it back up, right? And um, but things are things do seem to be improving. But however, last year there was an issue that ultimately I would say cost me probably a million dollars at least of sales on Amazon, at least. And there were there was inventory that disappeared and maybe was sold. And Amazon, though, to their credit, they made it right. And I, I have no complaints, actually. And again, I, I'm not going to go into too many details, but, but there's stuff like that where, I, again, I don't know if it's just my temperament, but... Um, I, I didn't, I didn't even care, dude. I, Cause I, I feel like I'm so desensitized now to this bullshit where it's like, oh yeah, there's, an, there's, we lo lost a bunch of money here, lost a bunch of money there, made some money here. This person did good work. This person did bad work. Um, and so fortunately we just kind of, we, you just, you know, okay, what's the plan? What are we going to do about it? How do we fix this? How do we prevent this from happening again, even though it's an outlier event? And I, I think probabilistically speaking, it will never happen again because it's so improbable what actually happened. And, um, and so, yeah. And, and then what, one other thing I, I think is worth mentioning, because I, and you guys probably get this too. I get people asking me, reaching out to me fairly often asking about starting a supplement business, right? And so like sometimes they'll say, hey, how did you find a manufacturer? And my response is it's I say this nicely, but I'm like, don't don't do it. Just don't don't start a supplement company, dude. If that's your <laughs> question, trust me, you don't want to do this because you know how I found my manufacturer. I Googled it. That's how I found and I started calling them like that. That's how I found the manufacturer. And my point, though, is if if again, looking at it as a this is an IQ test. And if that's the question that you're 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 stuck on, just just stop. Find another test. Find another game. This is not what you want. And and there's something to be said in, for that in general, where there's a lot to be said for having a job, for not owning your own business. And anybody who's owned a business knows exactly what I'm talking about. There's so much extra bullshit that comes with owning a business. It is not this glamorous, even a business that makes a lot of money. There's still a lot of extra bullshit. And don't think all that extra money makes all the bullshit, uh, oh, makes man. you love the bullshit. No, it still tastes like shit. It's the money, money. There's the, there's the diminishing returns of money. And there's just the, the, I guess it's maybe a bit of the hedonic treadmill of you get used to whatever money you have, you get used to your shit. And then you just have to deal with shit. That's annoying all the time. That's owning a business. Everything's on fire all the time. And you just have to decide like what fires you're going to fight today. And even if that's not literally the case, that's how it feels because you have in your mind this ideal vision of how things are supposed to be running and how they're supposed to be working, what's supposed to be happening. And then you look at what is there and you see maybe like 20% starts to approach these standards you've, you've envisioned. And 80% of it, though, just kind of pisses you off because it's varying degrees of fucked up. And, and that's... Every day, you're just trying to get a little bit ahead of that. Can I make it 21% good, 22%? And so bottom line is, um, for me personally, like I wouldn't, there's no way I would be interested in owning a business if I couldn't make at least three times the money that I could make working for somebody else, doing something I like, working for a business I like, with people I like. Uh, for me personally, I don't care about being my own boss or, or saying I'm an entrepreneur, I'm an internet entrepreneur. That shit means nothing to me. Uh, and, and for me, I would say it'd probably be five times. I would need to be able to make five times the money for it to be worth the extra nonsense where like, I like marketing a lot, right? 
um, and I like copywriting and I, and I have a lot of experience there and, and I like sales and persuasion. I could just go be a copywriter and make seven figures a year. And I don't say that to brag. Like I actually could, I know I could for a fact. Uh, if I want to just work for other people. Now, the problem with that is I'd have to shill. I have to sell stuff I don't believe in. I'd have to like, you know, go the companies that would pay big money. It, it's, it's all bullshit. So that would be a problem. And I wouldn't be willing to do that. But, uh, if, if I could just work for a lot less money though, in a company and I'm a marketer and I get to do work that I like all day, I don't have to worry about payroll. I don't have to worry about inventory. I don't have to worry about logistics. I don't have to worry about company culture. And it doesn't mean that I don't care. And I'm, and I'm a kind of low responsibility employee where I'm like, that's not my job. Fuck. I don't care. No, but a company wouldn't want me to care about that. They'd be like, no, no, no. You just, you just focus on doing really good marketing and writing really good copy and we'll take care of all this other bullshit. Don't worry about any of it. You'll get paid and your life is going to be good. There's value in that. There is absolutely. There's value and, in and that. Mike, I think, um, I think something that, that people who have created their own things or they, they do a lot of things or they're, they're managing a lot, they're juggling a lot of things, one thing they can relate to, and I had this moment, man, it might have been this month, it might have been last. I saw someone, there's a lot of construction work going on in Auckland right now all over the place. And I saw a group of construction workers smiling, doing their job, and I know they're going to go get lunch <laughs> and they're going to go home. Yep. And sometimes I have these fantasies where I'm like, God, that'd be amazing. Yeah. You know, like yep. I just want to be a construction worker or yep. I just want to be, I think I heard uh, Ryan Dorsch, you brought him up on his, he, he, he mentioned, I was on a podcast and they said, you know, what, what, what's your fantasy job? And they're like, you know, Ryan Dorsch would be a bus driver. And I was like, I bet you caught him on a day where he was really stressed by all, all the responsibilities and things he's juggling. And I think that's something that people who have gone out and tried to start something, it, there's the Dunning-Kruger effect. If you simply don't know what you don't know and what responsibilities may be there. Um, and and, having, and having the wrong priorities going in, not understanding, like, what is your first milestone? What should it really be? Like, if you're doing a business, it should be finding your ideal customer and selling them. Can you do that? And do it yourself. Can you do that? If you can't do that, the business is going to go nowhere. Okay, if you've done that, now how do you find more of those people? And how do you start to systematize this? And really that first is like, can you get this to a million dollars in sales? Um, and there's a good book called um, the, the Michael Masterson is the, is the is ready, ready, Fire, Aim. And it's... Uh, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a business slash marketing book from somebody who I believe he was one of the guys behind Agora publishing a uh, big billion dollar company and very smart marketer, smart, savvy business person. And I, I recommend it to, to, to people who are still listening, who want to want to bone up on, on how to do business. Good. Like that's it. And it, it gives though, like, I like, I like how he lays it out again in these different phases and how you need to be looking at your business in the beginning, um, to, to give it its best chances for success. And a lot of people get into business with no, they, they haven't even read a book on like how to market something or how to run a business. And that to me is absurd because you get into a business like statistically, how many businesses make it to seven figures a year in sales? I'm going to guess it's 5% yeah. uh, is going to be my guess. 10 million plus in sales, you're probably less than 1% already. Even even survive beyond five years. I mean, that's true. That's probably, that's probably 20%. Yeah, if, 20, that might even be, you know, uh, be a favorable estimate. I, I think I, I agree with so many things you touched on. And, and there are days, I'd be lying if I didn't say there's days I fantasize about being an employee again. And I remember when I started doing this, I said, I can't do this. I, I can't work for a company because I hate this. I want to work for myself. And now here I am, you know, nine years later saying I fantasize about being an employee where I, then I was fantasizing about being a business owner. So it is kind of ironic. And I think it just speaks to the grass is always greener. But we, we do. We're in a culture where we glamorize the entrepreneur, but we glamorize the success successful entrepreneur. No one ever looks at the person who's getting crushed every day and no one sees it because they're not on TV. It's the classic survivorship bias. Right? We just see the, yeah, yeah, the outliers exactly. and think like, I'm an outlier. Like, yeah, but what if you're not? And, yeah. and, and, and yeah. just, so yeah, ben, to sip with I want to ask you, Ben, if, uh, on the topic of, you know, 
not taking this glamorized view, not getting duped by survivorship bias like you were talking about, Mike, to move forward, uh, to, to make sure that you are doing something that actually gives you meaning, which I think, you know, regardless if you're making five times, six times, seven times, because you might be on that hedonic treadmill, like you said, Mike, to really find meaning in something like this, what does the future look like? What are you going to do to ensure that De Novo goes in the direction you want it to do so that you aren't hopefully in the future fantasizing about driving a bus or mixing concrete, not even, not even whey protein. I, so it's, I think it's, it's just like, um, how do you make fitness, uh, sustainable? How do you make a diet sustainable? How do you make a contest prep sustainable? I think in, I, I almost like the Arnold model is I find that's the inspiration I found from fitness is, is that it helped me build a mental model of how I'm going to conceptualize this so I can keep doing it and and sustain it. I will say this by far, like I've done the academic hoop jumping. I I have two graduate degrees. I competed I competed in bodybuilding. I've done 30 week preps. I've done powerlifting. I crushed I, I literally did uh one RMs Bulgarian for all three lifts for three months. Like I've done the most extreme of the extremes. This is by far the most humbling thing I've ever done in my life. Because it's not just about your input and investment. It's also being able to handle when other people do not see the value in your input or they're not seeing what you're putting in every day. They're only judging on the outside final thing that you create and put out there. And the reality is the best product is not a 100% success rate. Look at Amazon reviews. Look at 20 million hit YouTube videos. And it, it like, look at, you could watch a Michael Jordan thing where he's literally doing something that everybody glamorized in, you know, the nineties and it still has a thousand some dislikes. You know what I mean? Like you're never going to get a hundred percent success rate. So I think to answer your question, it's like, for me, what I've found to be the most, or the, the most sustainable approach is, is just following my curiosity. And I think the day that mm -hmm. this, this loses that, that intellectual, uh, uh, curiosity for me. It's the only thing I haven't been able to bottom out because I've by far bottomed out the physical uh, investment where I've just been <clears throat> the mental one. The one thing that doesn't stop is my curiosity. As soon as I have days that are really bad days, it's like the next day I wake up, bounce back. I'm like, what if I do it this way? What if, what if, what if I take this approach? What if I take this angle? What if, you know, what if there's a gap here? And um, I think a large part of the frustration for me is having ideas, and I'm actually going to give two very relevant cases actually to people on the round table here, um, where I have an idea and it's super frustrating because I don't necessarily, I can't pull the resources to do it fast enough. Like you'll hear from Luke, my, my biggest paranoia is someone's going to do this before us. Someone's going to do this quicker. We got to be first to market because the reality is you can't patent a formulation. Unless I make a new compound, I can't patent it. Um, and even then, it's going to be a drug because if you make a salt or something of a natural product, it's no longer found from a plant. Anyway, so the point is, and this is actually giving you guys props. like Unless you're uh, the guy who somehow patented beta alanine. That's made him a little bit of money. Yeah, Jesus. Ridiculous. Yeah, but still, even with concrete, you know, there's people you can get generic creatine HCL. You don't have to buy concrete. And same yeah. thing with Arneson. You can just source regular. Yeah, PA. but he he was he was aggressively litigious for a while and it worked now though he's been fought and beat and so it looks like his uh beta alanine empire is going to crumble but tens of millions of dollars later that's almost like the thermal life model where i will i will patent every nitrate salt of anything like if you literally <laughs> you know if you make uric acid nitrate you pee out nitrate and you and you like i've got a, I, I own you now it's just like <laughs> wwe patent stuff yeah so yeah we've seen that before but um I think, uh, fuck, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> so you were specifically saying uh, how some, some specific examples you can give because you can't necessarily, like, getting, like getting you're always worried quickly. about getting first to market fast with Luke because you yeah. can't patent your product. So, so some, oh yeah, so yeah. the, the yep. examples. Uh, so, so Mike w with you guys and, and this, like I said, I wanted to give, give this props as soon as you talked about Curtis and, and how you guys go about formulating is you were the only brand I found that uses 5-HTP in a fat loss product, which was incredibly, uh, so first it was mind blowing to me and I could, maybe another time we could talk about how I came upon using a tryptamine in a fat burner and why that makes sense on a, uh, uh, a pharmacology perspective. That's probably a whole other conversation. But anyway, 
5-HTP works. It has amazing literature support relative to every other supplement ingredient and fat loss product. So when I was doing my market research, I was like, shit, there's one company I can find that's actually putting this appropriately in a fat loss product. And it was you guys. It was Legion. So um, so kudos to both you guys. And you guys were first to market. And I was like, fuck, god damn it. Um, <laughs> I, I give Curtis the credit. That was him. Uh, yeah. But and and but just just to push back on that first to market, yes, that matters in some cases. Uh, and with with individual products, I would say it it can matter if it's something that really matters and it really matters in the eyes of the consumer. But yeah. as you've mentioned earlier, it really depends. Like, can you get a person to un- does it matter enough? One and then two, can you get someone to understand it? So. You know, and and this is something that Omar and Ben and, and you, you guys have been saying, and it's interesting to see how the space has changed the evidence-based supplement space. So back when I started Legion 2014 or so, there weren't many companies, uh, Ben, you were, but there were only a there were only a small number who were even talking about clinically effective doses or even referencing research actually correctly, not just actually citing random shit, which is what is well, happens a lot out there. And um, now everybody is talking, uh, the, the, that, that message that was unique uh, in 2014 is not unique anymore. And something that, um, and this is, this is something that I'm doing with Legion and I would invite Omar and Ben, anybody else who cares to do is like, collectively there's an opportunity, I think, to raise the bar of what it means to be an evidence-based supplement company. It's not just having formulations that are backed by science, because more companies are starting to do that. Even some of the bigger ones with select products are starting to, in pre-workout in particular, because there's a lot of money in it and it, there's an acute effect, Where, uh, which is, I, I like to think that I had something to do with, and, and maybe we all did, but pushing- I definitely think you guys have done Forcing a really them good to job. spend a little bit more money because now customers, when they start seeing citrulline and beta alanine and betaine and some of these things, they start looking at the dose, especially on Amazon, where you can easily just click around and you're like, wait a minute, Legion's pulse has like four times the actives of this. I, yeah, I think that's better. Like, you know, you know what I mean? You don't have to know that much to, to go. The ingredients are very similar, but Legion's literally three or four times as many uh, as much actives. But to, to raise the bar as uh, sort of what it really means to be an evidence-based supplement company, what I mean by that is, and I would say this is also ties into a bit of conscious capitalism, which is something that I believe in and caring more about uh, it, where it's not just bottom line. And that's something, Ben, you've talked about, Omar, you've talked about. Yes, profits matter. Anybody who wants to get into business, I recommend reading a book called Profit First so you can understand really why they matter. It is not some greedy capitalist thing to make profit. You have to do it to grow your business and to survive and ultimately to make some money and to make a living. Uh, but as uh, Ken Galbraith once said, that the, the corporate goal, at least in this old model, has seemed to be to engulf everything. Right? That's the, mm-hmm. that's that that seems to be the goal of business and sacrifice everything at the altar of profits. And who gives a shit about how it affects the environment? Who gives a shit about how it fa- affects uh, 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 communities? Who cares about even in some cases the people that work in the business? All that really matters is the shareholders and maybe the executive tier, and everyone else can fuck off basically. And that's an old. I I like I like that we're. There are, there, there is a bit of a sea change. There is a, the, the, that is changing now. And, and you do have bigger companies. Sometimes they're just, it's a bit of a whitewash uh, or, or a purpose wash or a science wash. It's not really authentic, but there are a lot of authentic examples out there of companies that are actually putting some other uh, non-quantifiable things on their on their balance sheet, so to speak. So, like, talk about the let's talk about the environment, for example. Plastic pollution is a problem; it really is. There's no debate about that. That's not controversial to say, right? And so, Mike, I don't want I don't want to cut you off, but just to make sure we get all the way around the round table with with each one of the individuals, I think you've given some really great insight into making sure that I talk too uh, much. I totally understand. I take <laughs> no, no it's, offense. No, I'm, it's, it's, I'm it's Mr. All... Tangent, and Omar has been very, very uh, patient. Eric, no, it, it, I apologize. Good. As a segue to Omar, because I, I want to give my example for for Ouroboros as well. Am okay, I, let's can let's I do hear that? it. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll start by saying, of course, like I, I, I'm still, I still approach things as the consumer, and I am doing market research and looking at everything, and I try not to let anything get past my radar. So when you guys released the multivite, I, I looked at the formula and. 
and Pete, I think Pete's one of fitness's best kept secrets. Like I think Pete is brilliant. And, um, and I noticed like what you guys are doing is different with not using magnesium oxide. You're using actually stuff that, and these are things that are really nitty gritty, tiny d- details where like, of course you can dose mag ox much higher because it's molecular weight is much lower. You'll yield more magnesium, but you're going to absorb less. So the fact that you guys are doing that, like I still get inspiration from other companies actually doing stuff the right way. And, um, so I just want, I wanted to give both you guys props because like, it's awesome that Eric, you brought us together, but I also want to recognize that, um, I am inspired by other people doing it legitimately as well. And I think we all, it's like this self-perpetuating wheel where we all drive each other forward. Like, even if de novo ceases, I almost feel better for what whatever its influence might have been on the industry as a whole, because it seems like it's better that people are now competing on not just the statement of being evidence-based, but actually valuing, like, like Mike, you're, you're hiring people like Curtis and, and Eric, like that to me, that is a change in the right and direction. Is, is my cheapest hire ever. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, your volunteer, your volunteer is, yeah. and, uh, Hey, I, I occasion, I, I'm getting protein. So like I'm, I'm, I'm getting what I need as a bodybuilder. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and Omar, so you contribute to that, feet. that beautiful physique that you have. Exactly. You, you own this bicep right here, baby. <laughs> <There we go. laughs> can I, can I, Sorry. Uh, can, can Sorry, I get ben, that, can I get that snippet, uh, for my, for my marketing? We're, we're going to be cutting that out. I apologize. Yeah. So I'm just <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, that was, that was my segue. I just wanted to say that before it got lost in the, in the mix. No, it, and I think it's really valuable. And I, I kind of, this has become almost a, a little impromptu going back around the round table where I think we started with the struggles, which was great to hear. And I think it's a very real view of what this is like. And then Mike, you segued really nicely into talking about uh, what you need to do to avoid those struggles. I think that's what we've come back. And, and what, I'm, what I heard from you is be prepared. Don't just be someone who purely loves one aspect of it or the idea of it, but make sure you understand business before you get into business. And I think, Ben, you're saying, yeah, you do need that. It is the lifeblood. That's what you started with before. But if you lose your curiosity, then you won't even care. So you have to keep that, that, that quote unquote passion element. So I think what I want to do to close out uh, the, the formal part of this, this, this podcast before we find out where we can all find you guys and when anyone's living under a rock and using different supplements, they're, they're just wrong, is Omar, I want to hear where do you see the future of, of or- Ouroboros and what do you see as the pathways to success uh, so you have less of these these unfortunate learnings by experience and more uh, things that that make the industry and of course your company improve. AI, that's the future, my friend. We're just waiting for the singularity, which is why we call it called AR. It. Don't forget AR yeah. with a little yeah. bit of VR too. Um, Need all the acronyms. I'll be very brief because I am uh, self aware of the fact you know being a co owner of said podcast and then I'm pimping my own uh, supplement on the podcast. It's like you know what? Let me sit back. This is cool. I'll be very brief, though, and I'll say one thing I want to touch on is that I respectfully, politely, uh, politely I disagree with the, the concept. I, I understand those struggles, but my personal perspective has been there have definitely been struggles with the supplement company and a, a wide variety of businesses. But I'd say the other things I've experienced in life outside of business make everything in business so trivial and I actually relish the opportunity. And I like the idea of having an acute stress that happens, which I respond to a lot better than the low level chronic stress that a day to day having a, a job or uh, being employed elsewhere. And I knew it was for me the whole idea of being an entrepreneur when I was working at a place called the Yorkville Club that's now distinct, uh, 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 sorry, extinct in Toronto. And uh, I was selling as the personal training director. I was a young whippersnapper. I was like 19 years old. They're like, this kid could sell, like put him in the seat, whatever, cool. And uh, I won't say the amount that I sold in a month, but it, it broke the record. But I received of that 10%. I got the 10% commission. Uh, and so they received 90%. And I sold seven times more than the previous person. So their, their income just shot up, right? Uh, but again, I was only receiving 10% of that. And for me personally, I would say that the freedom, the freedom to run my own business and to live and die by my own sword far outweighs anything else. And then setting it up in such a way, and I think uh, Mike's right, where as you continue scaling up or as problems arise, you know, it, it increases the complexity of what you need to deal with. And I'm kind of content in the situation of 
what things have evolved into from all the businesses I've run, where it's the right level of stress for me, where I enjoy that stress and I enjoy the adversity. Uh, one of the biggest ones when you said, what's the future hold is uh, just being a little bit more aware of certain things. Like when we uh, had that uh, potential lawsuit from Italy and we're given 30 days and we had to shut it down and we had we had enough inventory that would be equivalent to roughly eight to nine months uh, worth of stock that we had to get rid of. <laughs> And uh, we rose to the challenge. Like, it was just one of those things. And I actually, I'm one of those people when that pressure is put on, I, I enjoy it. So I would say the future in general, I would say, if we're talking about the supplement industry, now to segue to that actual conversation or the future of Ouroboros is basically just to keep doing the damn thing because I'm very happy with the way things have gone. I'm happy with the progress. I'm happy with the growth. I'm happy with the messaging. I'm very comfortable personally with all the choices that we've made. I kind of know the next steps and I'm not going to play out those next steps uh, I'd say out loud, it's kind of, uh, I'll, I'll just uh, give a analogy that on YouTube, I made one of the critical errors. And sometimes these expensive, as you said, life lessons happen to you. On YouTube, I didn't monetize my uh, video. So the first 50 million views represents roughly $100,000, if just the lowest amount that I didn't receive an income. But by not knowing about that, it made me set up other businesses. So sometimes mm. even the idea of not being profit driven first, and then recognizing that later, like developing the customer, developing the branding, the ethos, and really solidifying that and finding your place in the market, and then circling back, which we've actually done, as you saw, Ben, with uh, the apparel, Rascal Apparel, where we went from basically, no profit was okay, to we changed everything. My boy, Alan, throw all shout out to him. We changed the entire system, and now profit has gone up uh, a lot. But the customers are still that we're selling the same amount or more now. But we changed that back end. So I have I have some ideas of, of how to set apart the company in the competitive industry, how to continue to try and provide a service where there isn't or in a space that I think it can, it can be unique. And I think ultimately, kind of as Mike was alluding to, it's not enough anymore just to be evidence-based or to have the check mark or to be even third-party tested or to have for a pre-workout just the right ingredients because now that competitive advantage that would have existed several years ago as the overall fitness IQ has gone up, other people are rising to the uh, you know challenge. I would say that uh, when Gnosis first launched, I know actually the company, and I, that's all I'll say is uh, within a year, there's another company by this guy that uh, has some gear he sells uh, like fitness gear and so forth called high dosis. <laughs> so instead of gnosis is called high dosis. And it was the exact same formula. It's not a super unique formula. But uh, the whole the whole thing I would say is that you have to be comfortable with more competitors always entering. And you have to welcome mm -hmm. that fact. And you can't you can't just rest on your laurels is the one thing I'd say. So constantly just looking at the next move or the next step or where it needs to be and where it should go rather than like, oh, it's done well. Let's just sit back and then gradually like everything else in life, entropy kind of sets in. So it's a ball that keeps moving. No, that totally makes sense. I think, um, you know, you know, you've you've often called me and I appreciated Omar coach. Uh, on, on on the podcast and and I know that that you feel like uh, you've benefited from some of the the guidance I, I've tried to give you yeah. and in uh, some of those conversations and it's truly something I, I'm honored to hear but I've also seen you as someone as a mentor for me because we both are involved in a lot of businesses and I think you do a really good job um, with with keeping perspective and making calm rational decisions I think you do a good front of being like the silly guy on YouTube, but there, there's a, there's a lot of wisdom there. And, and I know that when I hear, when I, and I have these moments where I fantasize about being a construction worker and don't get me wrong. You look so wrong good, bro. That. No, you look amazing. Like I'm I think fantasizing I would just, about it. You it's shirtless, dude. I'm yeah, sorry. No undershirt. Just, I'm just, just the orange, orange thing on top. Like, it's just back to the romance novel. Yes, exactly. John <laughs> yeah, Locke, I like right? it. Ending where so, we began. Yeah. But, 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 but in all seriousness, I think, um, cause th those fantasy moments, they aren't, true fantasies they are indications to me that i'm not balancing things and keeping perspective and i think that's something you do really well and i think all of us are doing what we do because in, in the end we do love it but sometimes it's difficult to foresee or anticipate and then deal with the the necessary struggles to do what you love um so yeah to summarize all the things i've heard from you from the three of you and of course if i if i misrepresent is that do the best to become informed and educated and know what you're getting into, but then also understand that there are going to be things you just simply can't anticipate. But if you can keep the curiosity and still stand up you know, after getting knocked down, 
you'll probably be successful. And then keep perspective is what I heard from you, Omar. So I think it's really awesome to see where the industry has gone to that we have. It's not just enough to create an evidence-based product. It's not just enough uh, to, 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 to do things, quote unquote, right. It's great that that is a pathway now. And I think that's 100% because of what you all have done. We have a more educated consumer. Uh, we have people who are able to to actually have a lower barrier to entry to, to, to get things that are useful. And I hope that people, like you said, Omar, um, are, are, are aware and they can see those subtle differences of when they're being sold to and when the only thing they're being sold is marketing rather than something of value. I think there's a, there's a difference there. And I know in areas where I'm a non-informed consumer relative to where I am in fitness, I can tell that difference. And if there are two choices where one where one feels icky but the other one's about the same, I'm going to go with the non-icky one. So I think I think you guys are 100 percent right. I want to thank you all for the for the contributions, um, and I do want to open it up for this. any last you know parting comments before we we sign out. Um, floor is yours, gentlemen. Uh, I guess I'll just start in saying thanks. Uh, it's actually been nice to meet you guys. Um, to e-meet you guys. I'm sure at some point I'll meet you guys in person. Eric, I've met you, uh, but it's always good to see you as well. Uh, I, I appreciate you having the platform for the conversation um, and sharing ideas. I think stuff like this, again, is what propels us forward is like we can have conversations in our own kind of echo chambers, but when you bring people together, I think that that really is something special. So so thank you for having me and thank you for for uh, you guys, for you guys being on and and sharing. Got it, Thanks, Ben. You're, you're, you're a nice guy. <laughs> awesome. Uh, yeah, no, I, I appreciate the opportunity as well. And it's nice to meet you, Ben, and nice to meet you, Omar. And uh, again, it, it'd be cool to see the the what it means to be an evidence-based company to continue to evolve. So to fund research, which is something that I'm doing. You are doing. Um, I mean, we appreciate I, don't know if I, I don't know if I told you, Eric, I'm doing the, the creatine DHT hair loss study with um, Tinsley. That's fantastic. Grant Tinsley, great people. And I can't tell you how often I get that question. Anytime creatine comes up, but will I lose my hair, bro? The study I has say, begun. Well, I, I say, what do you care if you get like one more rep on bench press? They don't respond <laughs> well to that. So I'm glad I can actually link them to something on. Uh, Got to pick med. better parents. That's my hypothesis. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Better luck next time. <laughs> Yeah. Who knows? Maybe maybe we come back, uh, but but yeah. So so anyways, funding research. So there's some other things that I think uh, point of transparency, um, being being environmentally uh, responsible. So switching over to all recycled plastic. Also going to be, and what I'm going to be doing is I'm partnering with um, a charity. It's going to be a permanent partnership. I do a charity week every quarter where I give a percentage of profits. Usually it's related to, I think it's mostly veterans and kids. Um, but we're going to have a permanent partnership with uh, a charity that that just cleans up plastic waste. And it's probably going to we have we're down to like three and I'm just going to be giving a percentage of of revenue and it's going to be a fair amount of money every year. And so doing things like that, that I think is just the right thing to do. And I hope other uh, companies in the space follow me. Wouldn't it be great if there was more money available for research that wasn't just meant to like sell more pre-workout um, well, I, I think consumers, not, I, I, I'm definitely not interrupting. I'm just excited. I think consumers want to give to companies that do that. I know I do. Oh, no, no, that's a fact. Yeah. I mean, there's yeah. that, this, there's been a number of surveys done by a number of big, like Nielsen. I was just reading about a Nielsen survey, survey specifically on this point. That's very much a thing. It's a, it's about being a part of something. It's, it's a cause, you know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it shows that, because it's like in politics, it doesn't matter what they say. Look at what they've done. It's the same thing with companies. And and you have you have there are such outstanding marketers and advertisers and branders out there. A lot of these big New York agencies who launch these big DTC disruptive companies, they're very good at making stuff look and sound fantastic. But at the end of the day. What is the culture like inside the business? Who are the people running it? Like, I don't know if you saw that whole away scandal with the CEO who was like this raging megalomaniac, just completely at odds with what you, what the uh, Madison Avenue people were showing you, right? And then also, where do they put their money? Like, mm. in the end, where do you, as an individual, where do you put your time and put your money? That's what you care about. It doesn't matter what you say. And so that applies to a business as well. I love it. So do the right thing. 
And I, I what what I'm what I'm hearing from from everyone on, on on the round table is it's not crabs in a barrel, and that that whole mentality is so potentially destructive when you you deal with this new niche that is hopefully founded upon the idea of providing value, doing something evidence based, and improving the community. As soon like if you guys had a mentality of you guys are all the enemy, it would hurt everyone yeah. uh, in this kind of small community. You've talked about this before, Omar. In small tribes. You have to lift one another up or the tribe collapses. So I just want to say thank you all so much. Um, ben, where can people find you and, and DeNovo? Uh, DeNovoSubs.com, uh, Instagram, we're just at DeNovoSubs. Uh, I am not the best social media guy, but it's just at Ben Esgro. If anybody is interested in looking at chemistry extractions and, and the process of uh, small batch formulating. <laughs> Hey, I think it's pretty generally what people go to Instagram for. Yeah, right? yeah. Not, not, my, not my proudest fap, as the uh, Internet kids like to say. But. <laughs> awesome. And Mike, where, where people Wait, find Legion? Uh, LegionAthletics.com. Hopefully Legion.com at one point. But somebody else has that domain and they're going to want a lot of money for it. So we'll see where that goes. But <laughs> greedy, well, greedy capitalists, you know. <laughs> no, nah, yeah, those bastards. Well, I appreciate your guys' time, your thoughts, your perspective. Omar, I'm going to ask you to take off your Ouroboros hat, mm -hmm. put on your Iron Culture owner slash host, mm -hmm. owner first, of course, due to prior legal troubles. And if you could please close us out, uh, we'll finish out this episode. No, I once again just want to reiterate what Eric said. I want to thank Ben and Mike for being on. I think this was a very productive conversation and the peek behind the curtain for individuals that want to know, huh? That's why I go with those companies. Or maybe there's some people right now that are feeling a little guilty. It's like, I was that person on Amazon just looking at the cheapest amount and ordering that free workout instead. We that, all were at yeah, one. Yeah. You'll think about it a little bit more next time. I just want to thank everyone for listening to another episode of Iron Culture. You can help out the cult by leaving a rating and review on iTunes. If you're on YouTube, go ahead and leave a comment. We'll do our best to respond. We're back every single Monday from now to eternity. Peace.